Welcome, Rectorians. This is, after all, the Actors' Church of uh, St. Paul's Covent Garden. Covent Garden, as you probably know, was a little orchard, a little market garden, which was walled in by the Abbot of Westminster. But it was one of the spoils after the dissolution that fell to the Russell family. And it was Francis, fourth Earl, uh, who actually commissioned, fourth Earl of Bedford, uh, who commissioned Inigo Jones to design a redevelopment for this area. And he said he wanted houses fit for habitations of gentlemen and men of ability. Well, that covers most of us. And as part of the scheme, the Earl wanted a church, but he wanted it cheap. Not much better than a barn, he said. The Earl of Bedford, of course, uh, later uh, was very much on the side of Parliament and against the great uh, art collector, Charles I. But Jones replied to him, and you shall have the handsomest barn in England. And this church was the first entirely newly built church in London after the Reformation. And Inigo Jones found his design in the works of the first century BC architect Vitruvius. Vitruvius, uh, in his great work, uh, shows us what an Etruscan temple looked like. Now, the thing about Etruscan temples was they weren't meant to be seen in the round and certainly not from behind. It was the magnificent portico, the overhanging portico, the columns, and three entrances. Everything for the Etruscans went in threes. And if you go round to the piazza, you'll find that marvelous Etruscan portico and the three entrances, all blocked up. Because as you probably know, ancient temples, the entrance was in the east and the holy bit was at the west. And the Bishop of London, when this church was being built, 1631, early 1630s, was William Lord. He was outraged at the idea of putting a Christian altar at the west, the land of the setting sun. And he said, I'm very sorry. I, I know you've worked hard on this Etruscan fane, but you'll have to turn its orientation around. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why we've had to enter by the back door. But there is a very handsome portico, thanks to the Etruscans, and it was left vacant as a stage, uh, and it was the place where Samuel Pepys, in 1662, records what we think was among the very earliest Punch and Judy shows in England. Pepys talks about um, an Italian puppet play being performed on the portico outside facing the piazza. A year later than that, 1663, the Drury Lane Theatre was opened and that cemented the relationship between this church and the theatrical profession. The rector is very sorry not to be able to be here with you this evening, uh, but I'm sure he'd want to add his welcome. He's called Simon Grigg, and it was another very theatrical Simon, Simon Patrick, who was the rector here during Pepys's time. And Simon Patrick loved the theatre of the Church of England. He says the Church of England cleaves to the golden mean between the meretricious gaudiness of the Bishop of Rome and the fanatic sluttery of the dissenting conventicle. <laughs> now, we can't say that sort of thing anymore these days, but um, I think he got his message across. Buried in the church is the supreme woodcarver of the Restoration period, Grinlin Gibbons, that uh, genius in Limewood. A little later, Covent Garden became a red light area, and um, 
if you want to know more about that and its delights, there is Harris's list of Covent Garden ladies, which is a tour of 18th century delights. The fruit and veg market followed, and in a more respectable age, it became the custom to place memorials of famous actors in St. Paul's Church, which became known as the Actors Church. It's uh, a wonderful place to have been selected for our AGM, and so let's begin in this place with a prayer. Father, give us the eyes of the Spirit to see that everything that lives is holy. Bless the visionaries, the actors and musicians, and all creative artists who delight and challenge us. May they minister to our wonder and deepen our joy and thanksgiving for the gift of this life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray also for those who are caught up in the unfolding nightmare of the double earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. We pray also for those who are suffering and dying in the various conflicts in the world. Almighty God, from whom all thoughts of truth and peace proceed, kindle, we pray thee, in the hearts of all people the true love of peace and guide with thy pure and peaceable wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility thy kingdom may go forward till the earth is filled with the knowledge of thy love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so, remembering that we have to live up to the theatrical atmosphere and tradition of this church, let's all stand and sing, Thou Whose Almighty Word.
Well, dear members of the Rectory Society and guests, um, and our speaker, uh, welcome. And it's lovely. I would, it would be wrong to say that I regret the absence of the rector because obviously we would love to see him and we're very grateful for being here. But it did, the fact he isn't here gave us the chance to have Richard Charters uh, introduce the, in his uniquely brilliant manner, introduce the evening and tell us about this church. And I think we should give him a particular thanks because as, as you know, he's also our ecclesiastical patron. So could we? And because we try always to combine the secular um, with the um, ecclesiastical and, well, I won't say the sacred with the profane, and it's splendid that it's also um, to do with the, this, this church is to do with the drama. Could we also please welcome our non-ecclesiastical patron, Sir Thomas Stoppard. Stand up, Tom, so we can all... Um, thank you very much. Um, Before we get to the um, business of the day, uh, which the main, main business of the day, which is of course our visiting speaker, I have to do a little bit of AGM first. And I must first of all thank um, the absent rector, uh, Simon Grigg. I want to thank the church manager, Ben Chamberlain. I want to thank, is it Ben Costello? Have I got that right at the organ? Is that correct? Um, thank you very much, Ben. Um, uh, wonderful. And, and thank you also to Jack Greenier, who's making these microphones work. Um, we, we have a tradition, as you know, we normally go to, um, uh, we always go to a central London church and we normally go for two years running. I think they've all been great successes and I think this is a, a particularly lovely, uh, widely spread church, which um, and I, I can tell you how good it is compared with Gothic for actually addressing uh, the population from here, from, from, from this spot. Um, so, on to um, th what the chairman's report. Well, as you know, I don't really make one. I'll just very quickly say a few things. Apologies for absence. Um, the, I think the only notable apology, um, which is sad, but he has to go to a family funeral, is our newest trustee, uh, who is Christopher Geit, Lord Geit. I've, I've invented a tradition that the former Queen's private secretary always has to be... Uh, sorry, the Queen's, well, she is the former Queen, sadly, but the former Queen's former private secretary always has to be um, on our board. And Christopher Geit um, uh, is in exactly that role. And he's, um, can we please welcome him in his absence? He's a great addition. Um, <laughs> and it's very fitting that uh, he can come in because Robert Fellows, who we all knew and loved so well, has uh, sadly decided to retire. Um, uh, now, we also, of course, we mainly live on the free will offerings of our kind members, and I'll come back to them. Um, but we do also have sponsors, and Jonathan Ruffer, his company Ruffer, and Castleacre Insurance, both have been very loyal and long-running sponsors, uh, and they deserve great thanks and congratulations from us. Membership figures are the most extraordinary thing because they, they, they hardly vary in the whole time of our history. Um, uh, they are, um, we thought we were down. When we met a few weeks ago, we thought we were down very slightly. It now turns out we're up very slightly. So we are now, uh, this week, um, Serena Merton, who so brilliantly um, curates the whole thing, um, tells me there are 667 members and that this time last year there were 647, I think it is. Um, it's about, I always say this, we always wanted to be slightly more just because we want a little bit more cash flow, but actually we couldn't be very much more and still retain the sort of atmosphere that we managed to have. So we're not far wrong. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure that we've just become an unmanageable if we went up to 1,000, but always, we always like to push it up a bit more. And this does bring me on to the um, painful subject of money. Um, our finances are, are sound um, uh, and we have some reserves, but for the first time, I think ever, maybe once before, we lost a bit of money last year. Um, and uh, that was partly because, funny enough, in COVID, um, our expenses went down because we didn't have an AGM. Some of you will remember that there was, it was a, a virtual AGM. It just was me giving a very long lecture um, with a lectern that didn't really work. And nobody was actually in the, in the room. Uh, and of course, to, to entertain you all, 
um, is quite expensive, um, though it's a, a lovely thing to do. And um, so we, now we're back on having a great big annual general meeting. We made a very small loss. Um, and how we, can we make that up in future or make sure we don't make a loss? Well, the truth is we need to put up the subscription because we've existed. I was amazed. I looked it up. I'd forgotten. Um, we've existed since 2006. 17, this is our 17th um, uh, meeting, and we've never put up the membership in that time. So I'm, give, I'm giving you what auctioneers call fair warning that um, uh, next year um, we will have to do something about this. So I'm not springing it on you. We haven't hit upon an exact sum. Um, and I just make two other points about that. One is that um, we, could do, we could do this by direct debit, but actually direct debit I think is a bit um, of a devious proceeding. Also, it's a very expensive one for us. We have to buy the, the right to extract the direct debit. Um, whereas uh, at present, you, you pay mostly by standing orders. Um, so I don't think we will um, switch to direct debit, but this means that, of course, if we put it up, some of you, um, it's like the parable of the sower, and some of the, um, the uh, uh, membership will feel choked with tears and not grow, and will um, uh, perhaps depart. So we have, to, um, uh, we have to sort of bear that in mind, and I hope you've always been incredibly loyal to us um, over all these years. I'm sure the great majority of you will continue to be so, and the, the subscription is currently 30 for a, a, a joint membership. Um, so I don't think um, you're going to be hit with something really appalling. Um, but we do need uh, to, to put it up. Um, and we will let you know about that in due course. Um, as I say, um, I would like to thank Paul Felinski for um, stewarding the finances as he's done so well from the start. And he reports what is essentially a, a, an entirely satisfactory uh, situation. Um, now, at this point, it, uh, we, want, we talk about the visits, and the person who understands them all and organizes them so, br so brilliantly is, of course, Amanda Punsonby. So he, she, very quickly, is going to tell you about what's coming up next. Gosh, this is frightening. Uh, anyway, I'm delighted that last year, um, visits properly returned. We had three visits. Um, the Isle of Wight, I think you were still just being a bit wary of COVID. It was a wonderful two-day visit to the Isle of Wight, but we only had a few people. But then Oxfordshire and Dorset were complete sellouts. And um, apologies to anyone who tried to come on those visits and couldn't make it, but you just need to book early. Um, so now for this year. Well, tomorrow morning is our first tiny visit. Um, I'm taking a walking tour with our wonderful guide, Meg Ryder, uh, round Covent Garden. We're going to start in the church here. We will find the rector, um, and he will tell us a little bit more, perhaps, about the church. And then Meg's going to accompany us um, round Covent Garden for a couple of hours. Uh, Meg is the most wonderful guide of London. So she is a treasure trove of information. If anyone wants a guided tour of London, you should contact her and I shall make sure her contact details are in our next newsletter. But then the proper visits. Come May, we'll be heading up to Northumberland, well away from the home counties. I often get a lot of criticism that we're always down south, so we're going north. It's going to be a two-day visit, full of interest. The first day will be spent in the vicinity of Chillingham Castle. The treats in store include a Strawberry Hill Gothic Old Vicarage, a church with rather exquisite tombs, the rare wild cattle beloved by Landseer, and the ancient castle itself with its owner Sir Humphrey Wakefield as our guide. Day two, we move on to the villages of Embleton and Hoek. There we'll find a Peel Tower, two parsonages, two churches, Hoek Hall, the home of Earl Grey Tea. And my husband says I have to declare an interest here because Lady Grey, who started Earl Grey Tea, was actually a Punsonby. <laughs> and the glorious gardens in Arboretum. Uh, so that will be very, very special. Um, 
In early June, we will be indulging ourselves in the world of Jane Austen. Um, all of us, or many of us, live in rectories dating back to the early, well, to the 18th or early 19th century. And I'm sure we've all thought about Jane Austen when we look at our, our homes. Um, she, her father was a rector, two of her brothers, four of her cousins were clergymen. She was born and grew up in the rectory. Um, she began writing um, about clergymen. Um, they were scattered all over her novels. So I thought it was high time that the Rectory Society spent a day studying her life. Um, we can't sadly visit the rectory she grew up in Steventon because that was actually demolished in the 1830s. But um, in her later life, she moved to Chawton and we will be going to her home there, which is now a museum. Um, we'll be visiting her brother's house, Chawton House, um, the church where her mother and, and sister were buried. And then we're going on to members of the society, uh, John and Linda Fuller, who actually live in the old rectory where her brother Henry became the curate. Um, and so we will be having tea with them and seeing their rectory and wonderful garden. Um, in August, I'm working on a Gloucestershire day with Guy Hayward from the British Pilgrimage Trust. Um, summertime and walking shoes. Um, there's going to be a strong musical element to this day. Uh, Holst, Vaughan Williams, Ivor Gurney, Gerald Finzi, and many others all composed their music in and around Gloucester. So we need to discover what it was about the Cotswold countryside that so inspired them. Uh, we will visit the odd rectory and church, I hope, and we'll end the day with choral song at Gloucester Cathedral. And finally, in, autumn, in the autumn, our September visit will be a two-day visit to Norfolk. Um, this, I will allow you to choose whether you want to do one day or both. Um, plans are still being made, but I can tell you that one day will be spent out in the countryside, um, usual form, rectories and churches, and the second day will be centered on Norwich. Um, for copies of the application forms for the first two visits, that's Northumberland in May and Hampshire in June, are actually available at the back of the church. So do take one if you want to book early. And I hope all the dates of the other visits will be in our March newsletter. So as Charles has said, um, we need you to book up on the visits. Um, the treasurer puts me under lots of pressure for making a profit. And um, so I hope very much to see lots of you this summer. Amanda, thank you very much as always. Um, I think all members love the visits. They are the core of it all and uh, they're getting better than ever. I particularly uh, recommend the Northumberland one that she mentioned, which is the Rectory Society's contribution to levelling up. And um, uh, well, um, uh, well, it's very exciting. Chillingham is very exciting. Um, rather too exciting if you actually go into the field where the Chillingham cattle live. They are unbelievably savage and they, they have been known to kill people and they also kill one another um, a great deal. So um, uh, watch out. They came over with the Romans and have never been controlled by anybody. Um, one other person I must thank before we get on to the main business, because actually she's the person who really brings this all together, um, is our uh, secretary, um, Alison Everington, who, um, uh, as you know, also edits the newsletter. But the coordination of this, which she does with Serena, is really a tremendous work. And uh, I want to thank her and Serena particularly for, for what you're all experiencing tonight. I just spoke to our guest of honor a moment ago and um, I deployed the cliche with him uh, that he needs no introduction and he uh, happily agreed with that. So we won't, I won't, uh, uh, I won't uh, elongate proceedings, but there will be many, many people here of my generation who have grown up laughing with Michael Palin and have 
then come to in Monty Python, and then we've come to enjoy him uh, in so many other ways. And um, uh, as a globe trotter, for example, a writer, a great broadcaster, um, and he's now here in his not only in, in those capacities, but as vice president of the National Churches Trust, and he's going to address us on my life in churches. Please welcome Michael Palin. Thank you, Charles, very much. I'm <clears throat> delighted to be here. <clears throat> I've never spoken to an audience of rectarians before. Well, not this many. Um, and it's also, I think, very suitable for me, I suppose, to be in the, the actor's church. Not that I've had much work recently, sadly, but uh, <laughs> I have paid my equity um, sub. Um, just to be surrounded by these names, the greatest credits in any church um, in the country. Um, reminds me that I do have my name on a plaque somewhere in London. John Cleese was generous enough to um, provide the money for a plaque um, with my name on it. Uh, I think it's outside the Globe Theatre. And his, his condition was that my name should be spelt wrong. So <laughs> if you go to the Globe Theatre, you'll find Michael Palin um, trod here or whatever it is anyway. Um, there we are, not you do for friends. Um, it's not often these days that you get asked to state your religion, much less in public and on television. But this is what happened to me whilst filming the Himalaya section um, uh, of our series in Pakistan in 2004. The director thought it a rather good wheeze um, to have me try and buy an alcoholic beverage in Rao Bindi. The only official outlet he could find was a hole in the wall at the back of Flashman's Hotel on the Great Trunk Road. It was a fairly seedy spot um, next to a very handsome old Victorian church which had been entirely painted pink apart from the spire. <laughs> in my book of the journey, um, I wrote about the encounter. Round the back of Flashman's, if you know who to ask, you'll find two well-scuffed shutters bordered with a patina of black grease from thousands of hands. A sign in Urdu announces that opening time is three o'clock. A line, looking suspiciously Muslim, has already formed. About 3.15, the shutters are opened, and I soon find myself peering through a barred window into a gloomy little room full of storage boxes and men drinking tea. Before I buy, I have to fill in a permit, which would cause me, among other things, uh, to give my father and mother's name and my religion. Agnostic, I suggest. Trying to be completely honest? The man at the counter looks blankly back. Oh, all right. Agnostic with doubts, I wrote. <laughs> that seemed to do the trick, and he handed back the form. This entitled me to six units of alcohol a month, a unit being one bottle of spirits or 20 bottles of beer. I buy a bottle of VAT number one Rao Pindi whiskey uh, at a cost of 350 rupees, about three pounds 50, which the attendant wraps in brown paper and hands through the bars to me. Drink only in room, he cautions, not in public. I nod, grateful for the advice. He must have got the measure of me, however, because as I turn away, he shouts hopefully, I do gin! <laughs> anyway, this is rather a long preamble to talk about church buildings, but I thought I should set out my credentials, lest you might think me an atheist, um, who presumably would be unable to buy anything at the back of Flashman's Hotel. The church does run in my blood, though, and in that of my family. I thought I might, with your indulgence, uh, talk less about rectories, uh, of which I know not much, and more about the larger buildings attached to the rectories very often. But I'll start with an exception. My great-grandfather, Edward Palin, Bachelor of Divinity, was ordained whilst at St. John's College, Oxford, in the 1850s. However, whilst on a walking holiday in Switzerland in 1861, he kept a diary, from which we know that he met a 17-year-old American girl with whom he fell in love. 
It turned out she was not American, but Irish, and had been orphaned during the Great Famine and adopted by a wealthy American spinster who had brought her to Europe on the Grand Tour. They married six years later, and my great-grandfather, being required to give up his fellowship at St. John's for breaking the rule of celibacy, was given the living of Linton, uh, near ross on wye in Herefordshire. Linton Church, um, for those who don't know, is in part uh, some 650 years old, and the great yew tree, which uh, stands outside the porch, is believed to be a lot older than that. Some say over a thousand years old. Anyway, my great-grandfather and his new bride came to the village, and she straight away took against the old rectory and encouraged him to build a rather characterful new one, which stands today, looking out towards the church on the hill to the east and the Wye Valley and the Welsh border on the west. No expense was spared in the building. They employed, as architect, the highly fashionable William Wilkinson, who designed many villas of North Oxford, as well as the Randolph Hotel and an extension to St. John's College. It's a most unusual addition to a small border village, but in its dreamy Gothic revival way, it is a remarkable building with turrets, decorative brickwork, lancet windows, and a circular tower. It looks like a small German castle. It has a conservatory, eight bedrooms, a separate cellar for beer and wine, and it came with such fashionable extras as stained glass, polychrome tiling, carved newel posts, and painted fireplaces. I've stayed there recently and found it rather cold and, and quite forbidding. It was where my grandfather was born, and I'm delighted that the current owners, all vegans, have barely altered the interior at all. Since then, um, none of my family has had a rectory to their name. But as I say, churches have been very much part of, of family life. I was born and brought up in Ranmore in Sheffield. My parents were regular churchgoers uh, for social as much as devotional reasons. And from early on, I can remember, I would at 25 to 11 every Sunday walk down the hill with them to the rather grand church of St. John's Ranmore, built by Flockton and Gibbs in the 1880s with a tall, elegant spire and very handsome, non-pink exterior. We children were allowed to leave the service after the second lesson and were escorted across the road by Deaconess Gunn uh, to the adjacent vicarage, a long, low, roomy house, Victorian, neoclassical, it was always a bit of a mess inside. But here we would learn about the Bible story, and particularly about missions abroad, which Deaconess Gunn, herself an ex-missionary, made seem a delightful business, full of happy, cheerful, and above all, grateful young faces. I must say, I preferred the male missionaries, whose sermons I was allowed to attend as I grew older. They would be full of dash and daring. And I watched spellbound as deeply tanned men with odd twitches gripped the pulpit with what remained of an arm lost baptizing people in the Limpopo. <laughs> and my excited reaction really is, is at the heart of um, what Lord Charter was saying earlier, of what was special about St. Jack John's Rand Moor. With its soaring roof and high church tendencies, it instilled in me a sense of wonder and a sense of drama, which whilst the missionaries awakened, or at least echoed, a love of far-flung places, both of which things were to be recurring themes in my later life. The rituals of the service were intensely theatrical. The moment the congregation all stood up, beckoned by some discreet signal that I, I, never, I was never able to tell where it came from. Then the boom of the organ and the emergence of the choir from the vestry slow and robed, with a cross borne aloft by a man who also did some of the gardening, but who in my mind was temporarily elevated to godlike status as he carried the cross out. Sometimes my father would be asked to deputize for the regular organist, and I marveled at his assault on the keyboard and his energetic skills with the organ stops, so different from the lugubrious man eating his 
grape nut cereal at breakfast earlier that morning. My father was also, less glamorously, a bell ringer, and I would sometimes be allowed to climb the narrow winding staircase to watch him at work. And that long, dark, musty climb was only part of the drama of the belfry. I was transfixed by some of the heavier bells that would momentarily lift the ringers off the floor and into the air. Alarmed and thrilled to see my father on the eight bell rise heavenwards and stay momentarily suspended <laughs> before, to my great but not unambiguous relief, being slowly lowered to earth again. I was too shy to be anything more than an occasional contributor to this pageantry. I was chosen to read the lesson at one of the carol services, and my knees wobbled so much I thought I might actually topple over. But as my parents welcomed me back into the pew with a soft, squeeze on my arm. I knew that I wanted to do it all over again. As I entered my teens, I became distracted by other, more worldly attractions, Z cars and Elvis and girls particularly. But on our annual summer holidays to Southwold and Suffolk, my father was determined that at some point I should accompany him to visit the rich heritage of churches in the vicinity of the resort. Of course, there's no shortage of fine examples in the hinterland of Southwell, but the beauties of Southwell Church itself, Holy Trinity Blythburgh, which I now see as one of the finest buildings in the country, meant less to me then than the quick second gl glance from the ice cream girl as she handed over my cone with an extra scoop on top. <laughs> the sight of the doom painted on the wall of Weniston Church sent my father into raptures but as I looked at it and looked at the flames of hell it depicted, all that came to mind was Tell Laura I Love Her, a particularly depressing pop song of the time in which Laura's boyfriend's stock car runs out of control, overturns and crashes in flames. As my father turned the pages of his Pevsner and peered intently at a beam end, I would tiptoe up to the pulpit when he wasn't looking mount the steps and stand looking into the empty nave. And I must admit, I felt the strongest feeling of being completely at home. And I'd ad lib some half-memorized text uh, a la Alan Bennett and begin a sermon of my own. Little did I know that some seed had been sown on those much-resented holiday outings to the churches. The girl I was mooning over when my father was uh, trying to interest me in Corbells, turned out to be my future wife. Helen and I married in 1966, when I'm still married, and another church came into my life, St. Mary of Antioch, in the village of Abbotsley, in what was then Huntingdonshire, was where we married. Unlike the confident grandness of St. John's ran more, Abbotsley was old, very old, founded in 1138, it has an impressive tower, on the top of which are four statues, one at each corner, and all now in various stages of erosion. They're believed to be William the Conqueror, Harold, and two Scottish kings, Macbeth and Malcolm. Apparently, the kings of Scotland were also earls of Huntingdon, so a precursor of the Union, celebrated at a village too small to have a rectory. A beautifully calligraphed plaque beside the main door informs us that the tower and the nave are now looked after by the Redundant Churches Fund. I mean, I don't want in any way to derogate the work, but the word redundant jars horribly. Not only is part of the church still used for services, but the building itself remains at the heart of the village. Like so many similar under-endowed churches up and down the country, it represents a living and working community and should, I feel, be used more by them, rather than left cold and empty for, for six days of the week. There are churches like St. Margaret of Antioch all across the country, much-loved landmarks and examples of the continuity and security which has characterized our history. Whether one is a churchgoer or not, who could conceive of one of these buildings being knocked down? 
and according to a recent opinion poll um, published recently, is, uh, it's a view shared by 75% of UK adults who feel that churches, chapels and meeting houses are important centres for community activities, food banks and warm, sheltered places in time of need. 50% of adults agree that the government should give financial support to help our churches keep our churches open, and only 22% disagree. So we should find ways of using them, of, return, of, retiring, of, of, of restoring the function of a church as a safe haven for the widest possible congregation, which is exactly what's being done at my local church, St. Martin Gospel Oak, up in London, Northwest Five. It's a wonderfully eccentric and eclectic mid-Victorian design by E.B. Lamb, which prides itself on Pevsner's description of it as the craziest of London's Victorian churches. Like others around it, it suffered a decline in worshippers as the area's demographic changed. The current incumbent, Mother Carol, is determined to keep the building relevant. There are numerous musical events, clothes markets, and she's joined with the local mosque to promote activities across the community. She works with local schools, and lets out space at the back of the church for anyone wanting a quiet place for work or study. And that is significant, I think. With all the activities and organized events, it's always important to remember that churches offer quiet spaces to get away from an increasingly noisy world, built as they were for reflection and worship. I experienced this a few years ago when the Monty, Monty Python team were involved in a court case heard at the Rolls building in Fetter Lane. As the case turned on agreements made nearly 50 years ago, and as I was the only one who'd kept a diary for that long, I became Python's chief witness. The cross-questioning went on all morning, and as it was unfinished by the time the court rose for lunch, I was in the uncomfortable position of being a social outcast. I, could, I couldn't talk to any of my colleagues to gauge how things were going, or anyone involved in the case. It was very strange to see eyes averted and groups huddled together away from me. No one even prepared to risk exchanging a smile with me. I walked out of the courthouse down to Fleet Street where I sought refuge in the anonymity of a Subway sandwich bar. I sat in the corner, but soon realized that this wasn't the place to hang about. There was already a queue of people eyeing my space. So I finished my sandwich, walked out, wondering where a non-person like me could spend the next 55 minutes of the lunchtime recess which is how I found myself at the door of a church, St. Dunstan's in the West, a tall, narrow facade, I must say I'd never noticed before. I stepped inside, surprised to find myself in a distinctive octagonal space, surrounded by a silence and a sudden calm, which was exactly what I needed. I sat and contemplated, and no one moved me on or put on mood music or tried to sell me something. I must say, I walked back to the witness box feeling ready for anything. Did we win the case? Well, not entirely, but I'm not blaming the Almighty for that. <laughs> There's one other church I visited that appears occasionally in my dreams, so much so that I have to remind myself that it really exists. It was small, no more than about 15 feet long. The walls made from wooden planks sheathed in rough pine tree bark. A tin roof porch protected the entrance and a rubber matting covered the floor. The altar was a wooden slab resting on two tree trunks. A plaster statue of the Virgin surveyed the few empty chairs and the light through two small windows struggled to permeate a thick coating of sea salt. This, the southernmost church on the American continent stood on a hill at Cape Horn, somehow surviving the fiercest storms in the world. Tiny and tenacious, remind, it remains one of the most impressive places of worship I've ever seen. I've been in cathedrals when they're full and the choir is soaring into descant on hymns I've known and loved all my life. But I find it reassuring that I can be uplifted by an octagon squeezed in amongst the buildings of Fleet Street 
or a 15-foot chapel at the end of the earth. I think it was all meant to be when in 1975 I was cast as Harris in Stephen Freer's film of Three Men in a Boat, which is actually written by Sir Tom Stoppard who's here tonight. I didn't know that, Tom, and I, was, I wouldn't have put it in otherwise. <laughs> anyway, I, and I played the character of Harris, and as Tom knows, you all know, there are many, many moments when the character ends up in a church admiring the monuments, the tombs, the plaques, and has to be dragged away by the others. Oh, come on, Harris. But I was so lovely in here. And uh, where am I when I take a final pot shot at one of the witnesses in a fish called Wanda and kills her dog by mistake overlooking a graveyard? And where was I when I witnessed all the Monty Python team in church together for the first and last time? Here at this most hospitable church, St. Paul's Covent Garden. The church has been, and will continue to be, something of real value in my life. I remain an agnostic with doubts, but the doubts, like the churches, are a constant factor in my life too. Thank you. Gentlemen, that was marvellous, um, uh, really lovely, and um, yeah, personal in the best sense. Um, uh, let's throw it open to the floor and for questions, which Sir Michael has kindly agreed to take. Is there, um, I think there is a roving microphone, isn't it? Ali's holding it, yes. So, um, anybody got a question? I, I have one myself, but um, uh, I will keep it back if, um, if somebody wants to get going now. Any hands? Do I see any hands? Yes, there, please. In the, in, right up here, Ali. Um, young man in blue, yep. Well, I, I absolutely agree in principle. You know, that's exactly what churches should be used for if people do want to have their lunch and be quiet. I think, you know, you've got to have a balance. You can't really have all the, everyone coming in together, talking. You, you know, you've got to respect the, the, what the church is for. But the fact it's, that it should be used for that purpose, in the same way as I used it that time when I was, you know, in, in court and just had an hour to kill. I, I mean, it was a wonderful feeling. It totally relaxed me. I mean, I think get the right people in, that would be a very good thing. How you advertise it, I don't know. Churches are all local, so each church might have to sort of, you know, have its own sort of um, outreach or whatever they do. But, yeah, I, I'm in principle, I absolutely agree with you. Would I back a campaign? Not at the moment. I'm a bit busy till tomorrow. <laughs> have a question. Uh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Think, did you, could you hear that? Yes. Yeah. What is my favourite church? <laughs> and it might not be one of the ones I've mentioned. Well, I think it probably is, it, it probably is one of the ones I mentioned, which, which is, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, not, it's, it's not a very good answer to your question, but it, the, the church at Abbotsley, I suppose because, um, uh, well, I'm, that's where my wife and I were married, uh, it's also um, my, my uh, mother-in-law lived um, close by, um, not in a rectory, but in a little old farmhouse nearby. She died at 104, and the church is just over the wall from her house, so whenever we went out in the garden, drove up in the car, there was the church. And it's a beautiful tower, it's a really sort of lovely, simple tower, all buttressed, and with these, these strange statues on, on top. And I think because I see that church so often, 
and I've taken you know um, children and grandchildren through the churchyard, and they uh, <laughs> it's, they're rather wonderful. Um, you know, I mean, you can't stop children doing things like that, but some of the some of the gravestones were sort of at a bit of an angle, <laughs> and. Archie, my grandson, just got, got close to one of them and said, look, look, Papa, surfing. <laughs> um, so, well, at least I got him in the graveyard. They got him interested. And they were, they, they loved that church and they loved that, um, what it represents there in that little, little village. So I think that has to be, that has to be my favorite. And it also, it's, it's a reasonably modest church. It's not quite as flashy as St. John's ran more. Um, you, you, you mentioned in your talk, um, a great range of styles, actually, and you, and you hmm. um, probably cited more Victorian churches than any other. Would you have, a, in terms of an architectural style or period, as opposed to an individual church, would you have a preference? Well, actually, my preference is probably for sort of um, the, the sort of early English churches. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, hmm. I mean, uh, churches like, well, uh, Abbotsley is, is a smaller version of it, but I, I mentioned Blythburgh Church. I don't mm. know if many people know that, but mm. its location, the way it sounds, mm. and it, it is, it's, mm. it's a wonderful church. And that, mm. again, just shows the sort of the, 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 the power, the scale, and the ambition mm. of, yeah. of the church they yeah. built there in a very small community. Yes, yes, um, yes. And, and now it stands there, and it, it, it just, that part of the coast is um, is blessed with that church because mm. it's, a, it's a beautiful landscape around there as well, but the church just makes it, mm. seems to establish a presence there mm. and a place where you could go and, mm. and, and, and celebrate and sing and all that. So that's uh, that, that sort of period. I think that's about sort yeah. of uh, 15th century mm. or before that, yeah. Or, uh, yes, uh, Deborah in the front here. Sorry, can you hear me? Um, actually, I wanted to ask you about um, humor, which you're so well known for, and we've laughed along with you all over the, these, through these years. And I just wanted to ask, um, do you think humor has evolved since the life of Brian and Monty Python days? And also, um, what would you turn to for a laugh today? <laughs> the government. No, <laughs> uh, I, I do think we're, so, we're, we're sorely in need of a laugh, um, and we really do. I think sometimes, uh, I mean, humor does evolve and it, it adapts to certain situations. I mean, I'm working on a book at the moment which ends up with the First World War, and the, the humor was so important to, to people who went through these ghastly experiences. And then they'd be about to go over the top, you know, and, and, and many of them not coming back. But the last thing they do would joke about it. But it's just something that kept people going. So I think in, especially in very difficult times and very hard times, that's when humor is, is most valued. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I, I quite enjoy just getting private eye every two weeks. It just gives me a sort of balance back to the madness that's going on in the country at the moment. Um, so I think humour, yes, humour adapts to certain, certain situations. I mean, when I started, uh, the, the, earliest, the, the earliest sort of people who made me laugh were people like Spike Milligan and The Goon Show because they were doing things that my parents could not possibly understand or begin <laughs> to understand and were bewildered and slightly odd. I mean, you know, my father, would, I, I would listen to The Goon Show on my own and my, I prayed that my father wouldn't come in the room because when he did, it was always during one of those embarrassing moments when Blue Bottle was sort of... <laughs> My father would say, something wrong with the set, old boy. And I said, no, no, it isn't. That's just the way they speak. That's what makes me laugh. Um, so that was another thing about humor at that time. I enjoyed it because it was my own thing. It was my own discovery. And then I suppose we, we, were, we inherited, well, I swear we, the sort of pythons, the, the, the humor of Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, um, beyond the fringe, that was weak, that was. And that humor, again, was a reaction to being told not to laugh at certain things. And suddenly things loosen, loosened up in the 19, late 60s, uh, including humor. And they, they were in that, that, we were laughing at things that we were perhaps never allowed to laugh at before. And as we all know, you know, things that are really funny are the things when you're told not to laugh. That's what happens at school, isn't it? I was always getting told, Palin, stop laughing! <laughs> 
and you'd immediately crack up again just because you know the person saying it seemed rather absurd. But so I think it's a good. It, it just is a, is a, a much needed reaction to tension and sort of um, uh, you know um, be, be well, uh, and also you know being allowed to be to be able to make jokes about things is not something that everyone's allowed to do, and we are quite good at it here, I think, and it's something we should treasure. Do you think church contributes to that, actually, because church was a place where you were never allowed to laugh, and that is itself produces comedy. <laughs> the tension, yes. is, and the acting, the, the great performance yes. and acting. Well, uh, uh, that's what I alluded to mm. in the talk, so mm. the drama of church, mm. and what Lord Charlton was saying also earlier. Mm. It, it is a sort of this great drama, and I think that the, the best speakers I know in church are, are the people who acknowledge that. Mm. And mm. Uh, the worst are the people who become so pie that they end up, uh, you know, Alan Bennett doing, of course, his yeah. thing on Beyond, Beyond the Fringe, <laughs> was really but a certain way of talking. And certain, well, you just think, <laughs> well, what planet are they on, you know? Um, I think being, com being able to be, all right, you know, inspiring as you speak. <clears throat> and reflecting the glory of the church and all that, but at the same time being a human being, talking to another human being, mm -hmm. I think is quite important. Mm. There's a question there, I think. Just wait for the mic, please, thanks. Yeah. Thank you for the fascinating talk. The a fish called Wanda. I can't remember how much of it was filmed in Clerkenwell but I have a vivid memory of a scene with St. John's Gate, uh, it's the entrance gate yes. to the monastery of the Knights of St. John. Did you, during a break from filming at any stage, cross the road? Because beneath the post-Blitz Church of St. John, just over the road from the gate, is a crypt of 1190, one of two 12th century churches in London. Mm. I wonder if you'd, someone had told you about it or whether you missed it. Uh, well, I didn't. I, I mean, I have heard about it. Um, and, and my son's very much involved with Bart's heritage, which is sort of involved with churches and all that area and the great history of the hospital. So, but, but no, I mean, when you're filming, you're, you're, you look rather strange anyway. You don't want to go anywhere. People, what are you doing? Or, 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 so, <laughs> Um, I, I didn't. I didn't go down there. Um, but that's. It, it's. It, it's something that. You know, I, one should do, and to be in a sort of situation, you could have an hour off or something like that, uh, and it's exactly that. That's the sort of place you one should go. But I don't. I don't know of it. Uh, but it's part of all that. You know, the sort of huge, rich heritage of churches just in in the Clerkenwell area. I mean, quite apart from the rest of London and the rest of the country. And they're all so different, and they all have a you know, different feel and different atmosphere, um, which I think is, is, is another thing we forget. Mm, churches mm. just aren't the same. You yeah. don't go into a church and say, well, this is like an office, you know what? Mm. There's the printer and there's this, that, and the other. Mm. You know, they, they, they have mm. exactly their own feel, which is what I love about them. Yes, yes. Uh, in the middle, yeah, please, yes. Um, here comes the mic. Michael, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm probably in the minority here in not living in a rectory, but I do have a responsibility for about 200 uh, in a diocese because I chair a parsonages committee. Um, what advice would you give to the church were, God forbid, there to be another pandemic on how churches should be kept open or not? I'm sorry, I mean, what, what advice would I give to to, to... to the hierarchy of the church in the event there were another pandemic about whether to stay open oh, or... I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of giving any advice to the church. <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps the chairman might. Sorry not, no. I'll, I'll think of something then. <laughs> <laughs> any other... Yes, there, thank you. I wonder if you could be very kind and give a few minutes on the National Churches Trust. Do you, um, is that for the fabric of the buildings or for the music or for the people who come into church or what, what does it cover? Well, again, I can't give you absolutely the, the policy of the National Churches Trust because I'm a, I'm a patron, but I don't have that much 
involvement in the daily running of it. But I um, mean, basically, they are. It, it's it's to keep churches used and to um, encourage people to use. Well, what we were saying earlier on, use them as spaces to come to, um, keep them open. Uh, in terms of sort of um, paying for the fabric and, and helping the fabric of churches and all that, we raise a certain amount of money. Um, one has to be very fairly selective of the churches that, that we help out. Um, but we, I mean, basically it is to um, encourage the churches to stay open um, and help in any way we can with a church, especially if there's a church that's about to be closed for any reason. I mean, we that would be very much the sort of thing that the National Churches Trust would want to, would want to help with. Um, and just really to make people aware of the number of churches um, in the country, the heritage that we have of these, these churches, and to use them um, much more fully than perhaps we do at the moment. When you say stay open, <clears throat> that, that, not, that includes being open not for worship. I mean, yes, oh yes. I mean, you, you criticize the word redundant, but it includes them. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. I mean, <coughs> it, 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 yes, Ch churches can be used for, for whatever. Yes, yeah, 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 exactly. Very yeah. much important that. Any more questions? Oh, ah, yes, there. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your talk. I was wondering, do you think that if Life of Brian had not been made when it was, it could be made today, given how society has, uh, religion has such a different place in society. And related to that, I was just wondering if you had any comment on how it is for you to have one of the songs from that becoming sung in church as one of the most popular funeral songs, and it's seemingly increasingly so. Yeah, I'm very, very envious of Eric Idle, who wrote um, Always Look on the Bright Side, um, because it does get an enormous number of royalties from funerals nowadays. I think it's just. <laughs> Somehow that should be reflected back into the upkeep of churches. Um, could Life of Brian be made now? Is that, that was the first part of your question. Um, if I didn't go wrong. Um, I think it'd be very, very difficult. I mean, if you just look at Life of Brian now, it was really sort of a lot of the, um, a lot of the scenes amongst the groups or discussing what they should do and the revolutionaries and all that is, is sort of, it's actually very much what discussions are about about nowadays, place of women in the church and all that, and and, and you know, attitudes to attitudes to women and all that sort of thing. But also, I think attitudes to to belief. I mean, I, I hope that the life of Brian could be shown again because I think it's more about people, and uh, it, it, it's 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 not really about. Um, church doctrine or anything like that, or, or religious belief, or whether people should have faith or not have faith. It's about what happens when people get the wrong man and go in a, you know, en masse to follow someone who isn't the person they should be following. But there's also quite a lot in it, which I think is, was, was quite sort of forward thinking when, when I look at it now. Um, and it would be very, very interesting to see if it, it could be done now. I just don't think people probably would write that sort of film nowadays. There are just too, too many pitfalls. What would you think if it was transferred to a Muslim satire? Yeah, well, I'd, 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 I'd hide. <laughs> how would that, uh, how I'd would hide that get on? keep well out of the way, I tell you. <laughs> yes. No, I... <laughs> Um, I think you need some Muslim writers to write that. And there are them <laughs> who probably would do it, absolutely. Satire is, is you know, we need. We do. Um, is, it's as, it, we've probably got time just for one more question, if somebody would want, and then we should all have a drink. Yes, just by the bar. Thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, Michael, that was fascinating. And w you put me in mind of an encounter that Rebecca and my wife and I had with the last Archbishop of Canterbury some years ago uh, when I was Dean of Exeter. Um, and he stood at the west end of the cathedral and said, every cathedral does something different to me. Um, and I asked him, what does this one do? And he said, this one smiles at me. <laughs> uh, and, and what went through my mind was to wonder, what's the quality that you think is most important in what a church can offer 
to the person who just walks in? Well, I think it's a sort of, there's a, the building itself has to have a certain confidence um, in the way it looks and the way it's, the, 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 the architecture of the building. And it has to make you feel you've come here some, in a building that someone has specially constructed for people to come in and worship or, or, or get come together. They're not buying or selling anything. Um, that, that it should be a space where people feel immediately um, that they are protected, I suppose, in a way. I think very much the church as a haven, which I always used to, you know, like the idea that in, in of course, the Middle Ages, churches, everyone brought their cattle into church and sheep and all that um, to, you know, get away from the hostile elements outside. Uh, and, and I also think that thinking back to, you know, sort of 500, 600 years ago, and you think of the size of the churches in amongst the communities compared to all the other buildings around. Very, very impressive. So there's something about that church which says you'll be, you'll be safe here. And also, you know, that, that will elevate whatever mood you have, will can, can help you um, feel that, that there's someone sort of protecting you. Um, so I think that's, that's quite important. The size, the scale, the presence of the church is, is, is important. Mind you, I've just said that I, the little church at, at um, you know, Cape Horn was the church that had the most profound influence on me. So it is also about, but even there, you wouldn't expect a building to be anywhere near the, e the edge of that, that cliff and those storms. So the fact it's there at all gives you a feeling that some strength is being given you by the building um, which you enter. Does that make sense, or is it time for a drink? Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Michael, thank you very much. It's really been Pleasure. a wonderful talk. It's well, full of you. charm and subtlety and interest and so beautifully interweaved with your own experiences and, and more general thoughts. And really, I think you've achieved tonight what you really want to achieve. You've been saying you want to achieve in churches, which you've filled them <laughs> with. Um, and you filled this one tonight <laughs> with an entirely delighted audience. You've done it wonderfully. Would you now please move among the people? <laughs> um, <laughs>